You know, I used to do long, long distance running. Uh, it was about uh, 30 pounds ago. And there's a saying when you're preparing to run a marathon, which is 26.2 miles, that gives you, that, there's a saying that gives you perspective on what we're going to talk about today. The saying is when you reach mile 20, you're halfway there. What that speaks to is how, as much as we think about the external benchmarks of running a race, much of the real work is not the external miles, but the internal work. Of course, there's the external effort of putting in the miles every day, but the work doesn't start there. Even before getting up early and stretching, there's internal work that physically and mentally challenges you. Your body needs to adjust to a healthier, more effective diet. You need to be patient with your body through injuries. Yet some days, maybe even race day, exhaustion is going to set in and you will want to quit. I think that's why Paul at some point compares the Christian life to a race. That the Christian life is often looked at in terms of behavior, is it not? The externals, the miles put in. But the externals are the natural outgrowth and fruit of an internal change that happens through knowing God. This is what our epistle reading speaks of today. It says, Now, as I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, due to the hardness of heart. Internal. They have become callous and given themselves over to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity, external. In this very first verse, you see the internal life being followed by actions. Paul starts by telling them what not to do, by pointing out how they should not be. Let's, let's go in the right order here. Examine your heart because if it's hardened or calloused, it will make you ignorant and alienated from the life of God. And without proper understanding, your mind will be consumed with futility. You'll walk like the ones who don't trust God at all, given into your senses and to, into your greed. But verse 20 says, and 21, but that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus. Again, first things first, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, right? Jesus is the truth. So it's important that you understand the order here. It's a result of knowing him. That you put off your old self. You are renewed in the spirit of your mind. That you're putting on the new self. It's as if the old self doesn't belong to you anymore. It has to go. Because your mind is being renewed as Christ himself is being formed in you. The old self cannot stay where it is. The new self is there. So it says in verse 22, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Put on the new self. Now listen to the rest of this verse, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The fourth century father, Gregory of Nyssa says, there is but one garment of salvation, namely Christ. Hence, the new man created in God's likeness is none other than Christ. The one who has put on Christ has thus put on the new person created in God's likeness. That's incredible. If you think about this deeply, that God gives himself to us so that we are transformed, made new in him. Paul goes on to show how every external act is created to an internal disposition. We're just going to go through some of the things that he went through in the epistle reading. Therefore, about lying, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Now, this is not some empty rule not to lie because it's bad with the, with, the, with the finger wagging. 
This is for you to understand that you are part of a body now. The head, Jesus, doesn't lie. Therefore, since you are in Christ, you speak the truth. We are members of one another. We are members of this body. External action, speak the truth. Internal disposition, we are members of one body of which Christ is ahead and he does not lie. Let's take another one about anger. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give opportunity to the devil. Now, this is not a license to go, you know, go ahead and be angry. Just do it with a seatbelt or don't be stupid, you know, kind of thing. I get it. Sometimes situations rise up and you get angry. But be aware, the scripture tells us, that of, and turn to Jesus. Don't engage with your anger long enough as to give the enemy an opportunity to turn that against you or anyone else. Don't engage with your anger. That's the external action. Internal disposition. We're not going to give opportunity to the enemy. We turn to Christ internally. How about stealing? Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. You see, we we, we tend to focus on the don'ts, right? Don't steal. It's a Ten Commandment, for goodness sake. All the negative stuff. Sometimes we don't even read the rest of the sentence. I'm good. I, I don't lie. I'm not a thief. When you reach mile 20, you're halfway there. It's the internal work. It's not the bad stuff that should be occupying our minds, but all the things that reflect a life transformed by God, the new life we receive as a gift. It's because of how amazing this gift is that we get to enjoy sharing with anyone in need. The second half of the sentence. It's not just about stealing. How about language? Let no corrupt talk come from out of your mouths. But, here comes... Here comes the good stuff. Only such as good for building up as is fit for the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. The point is not that we don't curse or say anything corrupt or always kind of censor ourselves, but that by having our hearts transformed and our minds renewed, the internal work, we will naturally desire to bless, to give grace, build up, the faith of those we speak to. And so you see the pattern, internal, external. So let's pause. You may ask, how do I do that? How do I know how to put on Christ? Well, glad you asked because I have some good news. Our scripture ends with some some of that. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. So here's the good news. I started by talking about the analogy of our Christian walk in a marathon, how a big part of running and finishing a marathon is your internal preparation. And as every analogy that we try to give towards God, it's going to break down because God is way beyond our understanding. He's so much bigger than anything that we can understand. But this may help us get to what Paul's saying. See, when we eat, something takes place in our body that's already set up to happen. Our bodies know how to break down the nutrients, get nourished just the way it should. I trained for, for marathons for years, and I didn't think much about what was going on inside of me when I ate that chicken and I ate that salad. I just ate the food I needed. The good news is that God also prepares our spirits to receive him. I don't make my heart and mind be transformed any more than I make nutrients get into my cells. It's called the fruit of the spirit. You don't see an apple tree working hard to produce apples, right? It's not like it squeezes out apples. Paul says we were already sealed by the Spirit to be redeemed. It's an internal work that he does naturally in us that have put on Christ. 
He warns us not to grieve, not to quench the spirit in us. If we keep coming to the Lord, and that's the, that's the important thing, keep coming to the Lord with a desire to be transformed as much as you have faith to receive it. He will equip us in such a way that before we know it, we will be face to face with him. And I'm not talking about in the great by and by. I'm talking about today. Being face to face with the holy God. That life starts now and it transforms us. And then like Paul says in Philippians, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion.